Hi, everyone. I'm so excited to see all of you. We are here today to learn about the Ayush's cardiovascular program and different products they have to support that. I am the owner of Evolving Nutrition. My name is Amanda Abenanti, and we've been in business for about 10 years. In fact, we celebrated our 10 year anniversary in January. And we can't wait to partner with you guys and work with you on any of your supplement needs. So please feel free to reach out. We are going to offer free shipping to anyone who has attended this webinar. So if you are able to join us, please let us know, contact us directly, and then we will make sure that we issue that free shipping on your order. Now, unfortunately, Dr. Sodi was not able to join us today. He had a family emergency that called him away. But Dr. Brian Keenan, who is the education manager at Ayush Herbs, is going to be doing the presentation for everyone. And it's the same presentation that Dr. Sodi would have done. So please give a warm welcome to Dr. Brian. And I look forward to hearing everything you have to say, sir. All right. Hi, everyone. Thank you for letting me be your pinch hitter. I know some of you come for the Sodi show, and I promise it will be back. Um, my name is Dr. Brian Keenan. I'm a naturopathic doctor, and I am a acupuncturist, um, and I am also the education manager here at IU Sherbs. Also, if you hear a weird ringing in the background, that's me. Um, the fire alarm has just gone off in my apartment where I am doing this talk. However, that happens a lot, unfortunately. So um, you gotta love a good, a good twist. Um, today we're gonna be talking about Ayurvedic medicine and cardiology. It's a pretty jam-packed slideshow. So I'm gonna be moving pretty quickly. I wanna give you information and also discuss our products. That said, uh, I, have, I used to be a former faculty member at Bastyr University and I've taught remotely quite a bit. So I'm pretty adept at managing the chat while teaching. So if you have questions, just go ahead and put them in the chat. If I am able to answer them, I will. Um, and if I'm stuck on something, I'll find out an answer and get back to you. Okay, so let's move right along to the next slide. There we go. Whoa. So today's overview, we're gonna talk about, uh, you're gonna learn some Ayurvedic fundamentals, including the dosha system. And then we're gonna bring it into focus with the cardiovascular system, the point of this talk. Um, and then I'm gonna to talk to you about some different Ayurvedic materia medica and lifestyle considerations as well. So it won't just be an infomercial on our products, though you will learn about it. A little bit about Ayush Herbs. We were founded in 1988 by the Sodi brothers um, who are Ayurvedic and naturopathic doctors. And the goal of, the, of our, our um, company was really to sustainably bring pure er, um, herbal extracts to the West, since there was a huge issue with contamination, heavy metals, pesticides, and it was this, they decided uh, they really wanted to step in and do it right and do it sustainably. So all our herbs are, uh, I think almost all, if not all our herbs are grown in Himachal Pradesh um, and other parts of India. So we grow the herbs in their native environment with farmers that have been growing these herbs for generations. We then test them, make sure that they're free of pesticides. They are grown organically, um, but as uh, many know, or uh, pesticides can blow in from other farms who do use pesticides. So we're testing for heavy metals, we're testing for pesticides, and we're really focused on making a pure product that really reflects both the wisdom of Ayurveda as well as naturopathic innovations. Our process is always the same. We look at nature, and you'll see this with Ayurveda. Ayurveda responds to human issues by looking at how does nature do it. We apply traditional wisdoms, that's the Ayurveda piece. Then we go and hit the books. Um, as the education manager, I can confirm, we do a lot of research around these parts to see what works, what, is, what evidence is there you know, to inform our products. Then we have to go back and think about sustainability, socioeconomic factors. We don't really want to sell. As a company, we have chosen to not sell products that are you know, prohib cost prohibitively expensive. Um, efficacy, of course, pharmacognosy and safety. Um, and then, yeah, we refine and then we go to Ayush, that's Ayush Herbs. So as we get started, this is a, um, there's two quotes in this slideshow that are from Ayurvedic um, masters. And one is very simple, health is inherent and it's our work to maintain it. As naturopathic doctors or as clinicians, you know, it's very important that we maintain health, but we don't assert ourselves as, um, you know, I healed so-and-so. We help them heal themselves. 
This is a very simplified version of what an Ayurvedic approach is. So Ayurveda sees each person as a unique expression of the universe. This is that nature is inside of you and you are inside of nature. And harmonizing this relationship is what will harmonize your health. Um, we're all different because of various factors around our con uh, conception and how we were raised, environmental medicine, epigenetics, all plays a role, um, which will make a unique expression. That's the doshic makeup. And Ayurvedic practitioners will predict weaknesses and disease using your unique doshic makeup, the way you came into the world. So um, it's really about balancing not just somebody's human health, their their, blood, their cholesterol, their blood pressure, and even their mental health. But it's really also looking at their health in relationship to the world. How are they during the different seasons? How are they living in their geographic location? Um, you know, in this day and age, a lot of us have moved to various locations um, that might not be where uh, our DNA sort of grew up in. Um, and it can cause external disease that can be balanced using Ayurvedic approaches. So let's do some fundamentals, okay? So the dosha, so what are dosha? So the dosha are essentially the distillation of all the elements, the five elements that make up literal matter, space, and time. Like, you know, it's very philosophical, it's very out there. They self-organize into three sort of subgroups, which is vata, pitta, and kapha. And each of these play a different role in human physiology, as well as in nature. So um, this is how, we begin to use diagnosis in Ayurveda is we look at how are these three forces, vata, pitta, and kapha, and we'll go into them in detail, how are they working in this person? And as I said earlier, everybody is born with different levels or amounts of vata, pitta, and kapha. Um, and, that, and that will come into the, con the idea of constitution. So I am constitutionally vata. What is that? We'll talk about um, just this is another way to think about it, which is uh, some people like to think of it as anabolism, catabolism, and metabolism. So kapha builds things up, vata breaks things down and moves them around, and pitta transforms them. So this is, again, just another slide, which is how Ayurveda does individualism. By understanding your constitutional type, meaning of these three dosha, which one shows up the most for you? Which one do you resemble the most? And now you have all three, but which one is kind of dominant? That will impact how you move in and out of health. Um, one way I like to say it is your dominant dosha is your greatest strength and your greatest weakness. Um, and it helps to predict how to stay in balance. So let's talk about those doshas, break them down. The first one is vata. Vata controls all the movements of the body, from the breath coming in and going out, to being able to walk around, to ions moving in and out of the cell. All movement is governed by vata. As a result, vata is essential to eliminate wastes because you have to move them out of the body. Um, it is often considered the most important dosha. This is mostly to say once you stop moving, you're dead. And therefore, it's guarded as the most, uh, even if it's not your constitutional type, it's something that you must always manage. Um, it dominates below the navel and belly button. It is actually said to be housed in the large intestine. Um, and then when not in balance, the, we're going to see all the dosha have emotions that are connected to them. Because in Ayurveda, there is no separation of body, mind, and spirit. These, If there's a mental concern, it is of a certain dosha and can be balanced uh, using techniques to balance that dosha. The particular emotions associated with vata are anxiety and fear. Um, and this kind of makes sense. The other side of those emotion, of that emotion is courage and the will to go out and to do something. Next is pitta. Pitta is our fi the fire that's within us. It's our ability to transform. It's also directly related to fire and stomach fire and digestion. So whenever there's a digestive issue, then there is a, um, we're going to look at pitta. It's going to be something that we focus on. Um, it might involve vata, it might involve kapha as well, but we go straight kind of to the pitta. 
Um, but I also like to teach people and remind them that Pitta is also how we transform our experiences. How do we look at the world? There's so much going on in the world right now. And how do we digest that? How does that sit with us? Um, it also governs our blood. So we're gonna see that it plays a big role in how we treat cardiovascular disease. Um, and when imbalanced, Pitta is fiery. It's a fiery personality. Um, it is the person who is competitive, who likes to win, who likes to be seen, who likes to lead, even if they shouldn't, uh, they like to. And when they don't get what they want, their initial response is anger or frustration. You know, this is the person where they're driving and somebody is going at exactly the speed limit and they get very upset, frustrated, angry, move, I gotta go. Um, that's Pitta. And then there's beautiful Kapha. So Kapha represents the structure and the lubrication of the body. It is cold and wet. Um, it is all about growth. For instance, when we look at, um, in Ayurveda, we define different ages by the dosha. So when you are born until you hit puberty, you're in the kapha stage of life. And think about all the snot kids have, right? There's all this water and lubrication and phlegm, very common for them, and then they grow out of it. Uh, this is an example of that. Pitta governs from puberty to uh, around 50, 60 years old, and then vata governs uh, old age, just in case you wanna finish that thought. Um, when imbalanced though, they get stuck because it's heavy. It's the densest of the doshas. It's the thing that makes everything gel together. And when there's too much gelling, movement gets upset. Oh good, they turned off the alarm. Um, so movement gets uh, hindered by too much kapha. And again, we'll see that, uh, how that can impact cardiovascular disease. So let's now move into the heart of the matter. So one thing that I really stress for every clinician out there um, is, is what Ayurveda says, which is all diseases begin in the mind. Now that doesn't say, sometimes people read that wrong and think, you know, oh, you know, it's just a matter of perception. No, they're saying that our emotions are the primary trigger for most diseases. And they will, because they very quickly impact the doshic makeup. They impact all aspects of our life. And, you know, it makes sense. Cognition and perception um, all do play a role in your, in how well you're going to do. Um, not always though, there are, of course are limitations to that, but always with my patients, I want to make sure I understand where their mind is. Is it steady? Is it flowing? Are they anxious? Are they stuck on something? Are they angry? Um, all of these things are very important. So two dosha are considered more responsible for cardiac pathology, um, moving into that part of it. Uh, vata, because it moves, right? So blood is moving around the body. It's up to vata to do that. Um, so anything where movement is impeded or is excessive, um, that's going to be a vata concern. And we're going to use vata pacifying strategies to manage it. Um, and then pitta is that heat and transformation. Um, so this makes sense because pitta is supposed to be making everything transform. It's supposed to warm the body and keep everything going. But pitta is the one that also tends to go very far into excess, too much fire, too much heat. And then we see rising blood pressures. Um, we see the face gets very red because um, everything is getting too hot. Um, An emotion of frustration, we know increased blood pressure, right? A lot of, a lot of cardiac events happen as someone gets angry. Um, in Ayurveda, they would anticipate that. Kapha is less, uh, less um, called upon, but is not absent, of course. Um, more commonly unbalanced because Kapha is also very stable. So Kapha, as I said, it's hard to move it. So once it starts moving, that's not good. <laughs> Um, and can usually be some things like congestive heart failure, um, too much weight gain, right? Obesity is associated with kapha, and we know that that then has issues down the road. It will impact um, pitta and kapha because it's all about balance. Um, so here's an example, which is hypertension, which is uh, we rely on vata to make sure that we remove our waste. And we rely on vata to make sure that all the nutrients get to where they're supposed to go. 
So excessive worry and fear from a stressful job will disturb Vata. You're so sure you're going to get fired and you're not, but you are confident that this is, this is the end of days. Then the Vata is now disturbed. You're scared. You're, you're anxious. Um, it initiates the process of the body and mind inappropriately placing waste. You're going to, Vata is going to start not working correctly. So you're not, you, you start having bowel issues. Maybe you get constipated. Um, maybe, you know, you eat and it all just sits there. It never, ever moves. Um, these things are signs that the, your body is not moving correctly and things are going to start to back up. So in the case of hyper, uh, hypertension, which is our example, um, Vata's toxins start to get lodged in the blood, right? And who governs blood? Uh, pitta. So now the pitta is aggravated. Okay, so you've worried, now you're frustrated, now things are not moving as they should, and your blood is becoming toxic in the Ayurvedic sense. Uh, the, uh, what did I write? See, I'm, I, when I do these slides from memory, then I don't read them. Uh, so it leads to heat in the blood and that will cause high blood pressure and it starts to damage and burn and char the vessels. Left unbalanced, now kapha is gonna get involved. So you're gonna have cardiomyopathy. You're going to have, the heart is unable to keep up with this high pressure system. Um, this is one of many examples. So what do we need to do, right? What do we need to do to fix this domino effect that's occurring? One thing I teach uh, all my students is step one with any patient, see them as whole and perfect and complete. Um, just the way they are. I don't care if they have hypertension, they are perfect and complete, like stop. Um, it's very tempting to see people as their diseases and half of our job as clinicians is to actually break that cycle where people say, I am uh, rheumatoid arthritis, I am my hypertension, I am my obesity. So understand what is going right with your patient. Also check in with yourself. Are you able to see this person as perfect and whole, right? It, it, what's going on with you? Um, then what else is going right? So can they sweat? Do they have the ability to feel joy? What is their constitutional type in health? This is very vital to their treatment plan. Sometimes in Ayurveda, it gets a little complicated, a little advanced, but um, people will come in and present as the dosha that they are actually not. It's the dosha that's upset, but then they tell you in health, I was always like, this is who I was until blank. Um, and sometimes, that's very important information as you try to get to the root of the issue. Sometimes you got to treat the branch. Sometimes you have to treat the root. Second step of a treatment strategy, of course, is assessment. Um, understand where they are now, which dosha, which tissues, what's the problem. Um, and then uh, I call it very simply, remove the impure and support the normal. That's my little catchphrase. So you look for exit routes of for disease. Ayurveda does this very famously, you'll also see this in East Asian medicine, which is step one is to remove toxins from the system. Like step one is the draining and then we tonify and nourish. Um, and so that's what you'll do. And that's what we will talk about. I just also wanna remind you, it's not just about supplements. Yes, we will talk about supplements and things Ayush offers, but it is so much more than that. Pranayama, uh, breathing exercises, yoga, panchakarma, which is a very detailed, it's the most elaborate detoxification protocol that I am aware of, uh, nutrition, and of course, being out in nature, connecting. So um, yoga and pranayama, we're going to talk about them briefly. These are often practiced together. And specifically what they're doing is um, a lot of things, right? But in Ayurveda, one of the things it's doing is it's clearing the channels of the body. So many are familiar with acupuncture and the meridian system. Um, Ayurveda has a literal meridian system. People just don't often know that. It's, it's not exactly one-to-one -one the same as acupuncture in East Asian medicine. However, it's very similar. Um, and uh, what yoga and pranayama do is clear out the channels of the body. So everything is flowing, right? The, and this is the energetic channels of the body, but also the blood vessels, the lungs, the kidneys, it's clearing everything out, right? We talked about vata and the disruption of movement is very much part of what makes cardiovascular disease and yoga and pranayama 
essentially think of it as like they exercise the vata, they purify it, they help it stay on track. Um, so it's very important. And we know the research. The research is, you know, out the wazoo uh, for yoga and for pranayama breathing, for lowering blood pressure, lowering inflammatory markers. Um, it's just amazing. The In research, though, I do want to point you to the dose of yoga isn't standardized, but the most, I did a little, my own little meta study, and it's mostly 60 minutes once a week between eight to 12 weeks for, uh, or 30 minutes twice a week for eight to 12 weeks. These are kind of, if, if you're saying well, how much yoga, what's the dose? Um, it varies in the research, but that's a good ballpark for you. Um, meditation, meditation again, you're stilling the mind. Who governs the mind? Once again, we're talking about Vata. Also, it will pacify Pitta because it, it, that frustration will be let go. Um, we also know that there's a lot of electromagnetic field research that um, speaks to there's something more to this meditation thing um, than perhaps we initially thought of when we thought of the heart as just a pump um, and that we can really transform our, our literal being and, and extrasensory being. Uh, using it. And science is trying to figure it out. I mean, at the end of the day, when it comes to energetic medicine, um, it will be a long time before science validates it in its own definition, but that's okay. As also progressive muscle relaxation, mindfulness meditations, all of these things are really important. During lockdown, I know all of us should have been meditating quite a bit, um, just because I, I don't know anybody whose mind was steady during that time. Um, and also just fun trivia, American Heart Association did a meta-analysis on meditation and favorably said it lowers cardiovascular disease risk. So Western medicine, validating tradition. I like that. Pranayama. So once again, we're going back to the breath. When the breath wanders, the mind is also unsteady, um, both when the, but when the breath is calmed and the mind too will be still, you can achieve long life. Therefore, one should learn to control the breath. So once again, we're seeing this vata associated practice. Now, again, it helps all three dosha, it helps the whole body. And it's quite focused on really pacifying and nourishing the vata in us. And so breathing exercises, very, very useful, studied also quite a bit in human trials, uh, of course, because I can't get a dog to do a breathing exercise with me. Um, but the, I wrote it down for you. This is the four necessary factors as told by research, which is you need to have a stepwise reduction in your breath frequency. You utilize a one to two ratio of inspiration to expiration. This is that four seconds in, hold, eight seconds out. Um, and breath suspension at the end of inspiration that is twice as long as expiration. And you stay mentally focused on your breath. Move with the breath, they say in yoga. So this is very important, um, and I can't tell you enough that the things that we just discussed alone can do so much for any cardiovascular condition. Now let's get a little bit more personal. Let's talk about nutritional therapy. I also just adore this photo, um, but let's talk about nutritional therapy. So this is where we start to be a little bit more personalized because depending on your dosha, if you are heavy, big boned, oily skin, you tend to be um, very, very stable. You're able to just kind of go and go and go and you don't get tired, but you also don't like run. You're not a sprinter, um, both at work or even in exercise. That's, that means you're more kapha. Whereas if you're pitta, you're a little bit more muscular, you might be competitive, but you really like to work out and you have, are very goal oriented, you've got a plan, Here's the plan, and I'm going to tell everyone and do it. Um, and then lastly, your vata. You're very creative. You're basically talking to the birds. Um, you know, the birds and the bees actually speak to you. You may even be clairvoyant. You know, in, in, in Ayurveda, they would say a vata is, has the potential to be clairvoyant. Um, but regardless of if that's true or not, um, you tend to also have a very thin frame, dry skin. You tend towards constipation. You're cold all the time. But uh, you're always insightful. You always know exactly what to say and how to say it. And you're a very effective communicator. And yet you don't hog the spotlight of a pitta monk. That's a vata person. These three people that I just discussed, 
we are going to give them nutrition that will be different for each one. Also keep your eye on how food is eaten, when, with whom, how much. Keep an eye on all of those things. A lot of doctors aren't thinking to ask into it. Sometimes we don't have time, um, but it's really important to understand somebody's relationship to the process of eating. So here is a quick rundown. Um, I wrote it all out for you. If you get, if once you go back and rewatch the video, you might be able to read this all because I'm going to go quick. Um, but here's the doshic nutrition consideration slide, and it's a lot. So you have on the one side, this is good for everybody. Eat fruits and vegetables that are seasonally available, right? Reflect the nature that is going on outside. Reflect that within you. Favoring a plant-based diet, I think we can all agree. Research is strong there too. Reduce the consumption of meat. That's the same thing twice. Um, eat meals in a scheduled way and eliminate unnecessary sugar. Spices, you will change them and we'll talk about those for each dosha, but um, they are very important to, it's very important to season your food, okay? Um, and a lot of those herbs can be medicinal in their own, right? Um, some examples include trichotu, which is long pepper, black pepper, and ginger. Um, trichotu is just like a delicious little packet of warming spices to just help you digest. So it's really a lovely digestive. Um, cumin is a very good herb. It does balance pizza in the gut, which is important because no matter what dosha you are, um, eating provokes pitta to do its job. And so having cumin is one of those spices that really helps pitta do its job, not go too high or too low. And then I love honey, honey, and not too much honey, but just a little in teaspoon of honey a day, max. Um, they say it scrapes the kapha from the body. So it actually helps unstick you. And it's, I think it's a law of similars that they're doing with that in theory, because they um, like, what is honey, but it's this sticky, slow moving substance, which is just like kapha. Um, so here's some dosha specific recommendations. And the way you're gonna do this is, if the person, if you've determined a person's primary dosha or predominant dosha, then you're going to give the things, the foods that balance it or do the opposite of it, right? Because if I'm kapha and I, am, I tend towards weight gain, I'm very sluggish, I have a big belly, um, and I just, all I want to do is eat hot, oily, gross foods, which by the way, that is literally the definition of Brian, Dr. Brian Keenan. Um, it's not good for me though. Just because I love it doesn't mean it's good for me. So these people tend towards sluggish digestion. They will get constipation. They can have bowel blockages. Um, this is because they're made of so much earth, so much excess, um, substance that it's hard for the vata aspects of themselves to push things through because it's just like walking it's trying to jog in a pool um needing they need to be warmed up okay because they're cold so there's not even that transformation is also naturally impacted um and so for me like i do need I, like my love of spicy foods is actually very good for me however i tend to package them with rice and beans and carbs and all the things that, where I now, even though I'm having spicy food, which is good for me, I'm overwhelming it because I love rice. Um, they need to be warmed up. They need astringent foods, okay? Because they're gonna tend towards dampness. They need to avoid sweets and this includes our complex carbohydrates. They need to avoid dairy and red meat. I only manage to do one of those things. I do not eat red meat, but the other two, I'm not helping, I'm not doing myself any favors, everyone. Um, and these will putrefy and lead to ama. They need the light, dry foods, that leafy greens, bitter melon, um, legumes, tofu as the protein. These people need that um, lightness in their diet because they are tending towards heaviness. Pitta, however, is the opposite. They're going to have diarrhea, undigested food, because they're burning through things so fast and they, it just provokes this heat that provokes everything to just get flooded out of the system. The vata out, part of them goes, oh my gosh, we gotta get rid of this. And so they don't even bother to digest, it's just out it goes. Um, itchiness, of course, is a sign of heat. Uh, they must avoid uh, red meat. Red meat is considered a heating food. Um, acidic foods, hot spices. They can have some dairy because dairy is cooling um, and they just need to really kind of lean proteins and enjoy juicy fruits, cooling, moistening. 
Vata, they have very weak digestion, but it's gas and bloating. It's air, right? Vata is this air aspect. Um, and so they tend to be dry and they tend to get bloated very easily. So they are the ones who are allowed to have a little bit of oil. They're the ones that can have some, um, they can even have a little meat if they want to, um, because it's helping to warm them up and moisten them and help things move through. Um, it's just funny because the Vata personality is going to shun all of those things. They're gonna be like, I don't want that. Like I wanna, if I could eat a diet of just air, I'd be great. And I know many friends who say that to me and they are the ones who they need to eat. All right. So just so we know with uh, red meat, because I brought it up a couple times, it disturbs vata because it's so hot. And then the, the kapha can actually dry out. And this will cause, um, the, it can't ground and lubricate the vata properly. So you harm kapha with this red meat. And now we've got things lodging in the vessels like we talked about. Um, and some Ayurvedic philosophers will say, this is the calcium deposits and plaque that get charred into the arteries. Um, charring and frying, of course, makes this worse. Um, and it aggravates pitta as well, right? Who, um, which controls the blood and was already hot to begin with. Um, so, and we, and there's a JAMA article that talks about um, how that is not good. Okay, good. we're good on time. Uh, I'm gonna give you a little run through. I know I'm going very fast. We have so much more to go. Um, I wanna give you a run through on Panchakarma. Panchakarma isn't something that I only learned about about three years ago. And it is a long-term, extremely intricate detoxification process. And there are modified versions that make it not go on for so long um, because it can be, it can take months to do. But its goal is to remove years of toxins. It's an excellent thing to explore. Um, now, you if you've never done Panchakarma, you probably shouldn't be actually trying to do it in your clinic, but there are Panchakarma clinics here in the United States, especially in Seattle. Um, so it, its goal is to remove years of toxins that accumulate in the body, and it can be really useful for people with certain, especially chronic illnesses. Um, here are the phases. We do a preparation for detox. We fast, we get massages. We do a main detox and a post detox. Um, this involves, uh, you know, the main detox involves the things on the right here, which is there is some uh, anesis removing toxins from the gut, upper gut. Uh, we cleanse the lower gut. We use enemas that are made from herbal extracts. Um, we do this one. I've not seen done the blood donation, but it is in the history, uh, in the historical use of panchagrama. It has fallen a little out of favor, um, for understandable reasons. And it provides herbs through the nasal passages as well. Um, so I don't have time to go deep into Panchakarma, but I have seen patients really transform, like almost like they're a new person uh, after going through this. It's just, they have to commit. It's, a, it's quite a commitment. Um, okay, also, I can't help it. This is my, this slide is in here, so I take a breath. <sighs> Such a pretty picture. So forest bathing, we know, we know that spending time in nature is essential for human health. Um, there's some research that's starting to support it. And, you know, they're really looking at, you know, how is it really affecting uh, our human health? Why is it good to go out? Because um, as much as I love energetic medicine and I love philosophy, I also have a very sharp left brain. I want to know the mechanism. I want to know what is happening regardless of my feelings or philosophies, what is physically going on. Um, and the, we're starting to do that research. So that's very cool. Um, also grounding and earthing studies, right? In, in Ayurveda, it's, they say to walk barefoot. Um, so in Ayurveda, if you went forest bathing, you'd also do the grounding where you'd be barefoot touching the earth. Let's talk about my favorite thing, herbal medicine. <sighs> so in India, herbs are actually a primary method for treating heart disease. It's not just pharmaceuticals over there. Um, this is because they, they can do so many things at the same time. I love the entourage effect of herbs. I think it's why they're so effective and so safe, usually. Um, the Ayurveda practitioner looks to combine herbs that uh, support each organ system, that are useful across all dosha combinations, that support healthy tissues, 
to calm the mind and spirit, there has to be a mental herb in every formula in the Ayurveda. So that also have a support to detoxification. One herb in your formula has to cause that venting, that way out. Um, and then you have to balance that with pharmacology and pharmacognosy. Easy peasy. All right. So the first herb I want to bring your attention to is raw wolfia serpentina. This herb is just famous. I mean, they did make a pharmaceutical drug from it um, with the reserpine that is contained in the plant. And it has just been used since antiquity, uh, specifically to help with blood pressure and maintaining healthy blood pressure and helping the cardiovascular system. Let's take a look. It's sweet, bitter, and astringent. So what does that mean? It nourishes the body, sweetness, hatha. It's bitter, which actually helps the pitta stay balanced and it, de it descends. Bitter has a descending movement and it's astringent. So it's gonna hold everything in place in the right way. Um, lastly, it's pungent. Pungency in Ayurveda, when you see the word pungent, think pungent, it's punching through things. It breaks up stagnation. Um, and so this is a really cool herb. It also leads to trophy restora restoration, um, which is a fancy way of saying organ restoration where people will need less of it over time. And it is oftentimes people think of it as the main herb in cardotone. By the milligrams, it is not, uh, but it is just, uh, a it's such a famous herb that People often associate raw wolfia with cardotone. Um, I do get asked often, uh, how much reserpine is in cardotone? Um, and I do mean often, like at least three times a week. And uh, I am here to tell you there's virtually none. It's in the nanogram, 0, 0.00 nanogram land. Um, the FDA would never allow us to sell what would be considered a dirty drug. Um, so no, uh, and, the re and we don't have to take it out though. It's not removed. It's because we use the whole plant and we're not um, cultivating our raw wolfia to be high in reserpine. So it's the combination of the formula of cardotone that makes it so effective. Um, it can be very vexing to uh, certain, um, let's just call them naysayers. Uh, because they want to say it's a drug or this has got to have a drug in it. That's why it works this way. Um, and no, it's actually this beautiful example of herbal synergy. Um, it has herbs that support the kidney and help to detoxify. It helps, it has herbs that help the cardiovascular system. Um, and it has herbs that help the lungs. So it's just an absolute wonderful product. Oh, and it has convolvulus. That's another one people often ask. The, the convolvulus they didn't learn in naturopathic school. Convolvulus has actually been studied um, in humans and it helps with mood and focus. It's actually, that's our emotional herb. Um, yes, yes, there will absolutely be a link to the recording. I know I'm going really fast, um, but yeah. So absolutely great product, um, truly. I mean, it's our flagship product. Everyone loves cards. <laughs> um, the next step I wanna bring your attention to, uh, I have literally emailed the botanical medicine department at Pasteur University and said, why is this herb not in the curriculum? Because I was not taught it at Pasteur. Um, absolutely amazing herb. It's called amla or emblica officinalis. Um, it's also known as uh, philanthus emblica. It's got a couple names. They, they change botanical names sometimes. Um, this herb is one of the most antioxidant and vitamin C rich uh, uh, herbs or foods on earth. Um, so it is extremely high per berry. And if you adjust for size, it's the second most vitamin C dense uh, food in the world. So it supports healthy veins and capillaries, right? It's gonna do what antioxidants do. They support, um, they support veins and capillaries, right? They stabilize, they bind, uh, um, they bind, um, not bind, they squelch free radicals, if squelch is a word. Um, it has been studied also in people to help with blood lipids. Um, it improves glutathione, that makes sense. If your antioxidants are sparing you inflammation, you'll have extra glutathione hanging around. Um, and it has been shown to decrease, decrease HSCRP. Um, in Ayurveda, it is considered a resina, which is an herb that brings back and restores vitality. Um, and it is good for all people, all doshic makeups and at all steps of life. The product I associated it with was Trifle, which it's also known as Trifola is the blend. This is a famous blend. Um, it's one of the Ayurvedic staples. And Trifola 
uh, or trifle in this case, is what it's doing so, so well is that it is um, giving antioxidants to the body, but it also helps the digestion. And it does have a mild laxative effect, not like a um, anthroquinolone glycoside containing Senna tea. It's not like that, but it's a gentle detoxification. Um, so this is that route out kind of thing to remove the abnormal. This is the perfect supplement for that. It also really helps with digestion. Um, for those who have stagnant digestion, again, I talked, about, I used myself as an example. Um, I tend to use a lot of trifla because it just helps balance my digestion, um, even when I eat something naughty, uh, which is which is often. Um, <laughs> so uh, I really really like this uh, product. If you have not explored trifle, I would really recommend that you do because it's super safe, it's super effective, and it's gentle. Just an all-star product. Now, next herb is Terminalia arjuna. This is another herb that I, I got the pleasure of meeting only a few years ago. And it is truly a special herb because it comes with a story. Its name is Arjuna. Arjuna was a famous warrior king or prince, depending on what you're reading. And he would only go into battle if he was following, if his heart told him it was okay, if he was following his heart. And um, as a result, they just called this tree Arjuna and they use it for heart health. They use it for helping the heart, including if the heart doesn't know which way it wants to go. Um, so I think that's fascinating, right? Because there's that spiritual piece that we see so beautifully laced into Ayurvedic treatments. And yet on the Western or um, in the biomed side of things, it's been studied to help people with regular rate and rhythm. It helps with uh, cardiovascular tone. Um, it supports endothelial function. Um, and it really is like this nourishing heart supplement. And so I can't say enough about it. Um, our gelonic acid, so as, as is very common, they will name constituents for the plants that they found it in. Um, so argelonic acid appears to be the primary constituent that helps with this cardio supportive action. Um, however, I still believe that it is the whole beautiful cocktail of, of phytochemicals that make it run. Um, in Ayurveda, it is light and dry, right? It's astringent and bitter. We talked about that. Um, it's pungent. We talked about that. So you're seeing a theme here. It is contained in Arjuna heart, which for some reason has <laughs> a little animation. Um, Arjuna Heart, this is another one of our supplements that I really think people sleep on. Sometimes people use it as a sister supplement to um, Cardotone where they're trying to do cardiovascular support, but they want a little bit more. Um, that's a very good way to use it. You can use it on its own. You can use it for those who you are concerned um, that you're gonna have to hear about herb drug interaction with Cardotone and blood pressure medications. Um, unfortunately, I, I don't know have a way to telepathically tell the whole world, but we have been selling Cardotone for over 30 years and it does not have any herb drug interactions. It has not caused any problems in that category. It has just not been documented. However, the reserpine conversation that I had with you earlier sometimes makes people uncomfortable and that's fine. We're not here to give supplements that make people uncomfortable. Our Gina Heart is a really good place to reflex to if that's the case. But also I like to use our Gina Heart for anything where I also wanna support the lungs and the respiratory system. So really excellent. Cause the other herb it has in there is the Indian elecampane. So elecampane famous for its lung tonification. Now, if there's one herb to rule them all <laughs> that you will learn from this, this presentation, may it be ashwagandha. You have probably heard about it already, and there's a reason. This herb is one of the best studied herbs. It's up there. It's, it's, it matches with the ginsengs and the St. John's warts um, in terms of just the amount of human trial research that exists. And it really does help all aspects um, of human health. It helps with sleep. It helps with physical stamina. It helps with mental stamina. Um, it, it's also a very good aphrodisiac. It does boost testosterone in men, but I read a study that they checked it out and it doesn't seem to do that in women. Why I hypothesize that is true is because our bodies are wise and there are rate limiting biochemical steps in the formation of hormones. So while 
ashwagandha may support testosterone in a body type that makes, you know, produces lots of testosterone, um, the body won't do the same thing if um, that's not the case. So uh, don't be afraid. Sometimes I, I uh, have seen people who are afraid of boosting their testosterone. For instance, think about like somebody who has PCOS, they might not want any more testosterone. It doesn't seem to have any effect in that regard. Um, but on the other side, you'll be sleeping better, you'll be calmer, you'll have more focus. Um, and if you're trying to start a workout regime, you know, for a lot of us, we're trying to get back in the gym. Now the gyms are open. Um, ashwagandha is your best friend. So truly cannot say enough about it. Um, please, here it is again, um, ashwagandha. We offer it in a liquid form. We have it for kids and um, in a capsule form. We're very proud of the ashwagandha that we grow. We basically baby it from the moment the seed is put in the earth um, all the way out. We do multiple checks as it's growing um, to make sure that we have the right constituent profile that makes ours you know, special and potent and unique. Um, so we really, we love our ashwagandha and many naturopathic doctors who I've talked to since I've been working for Ayush have reflected that it does seem to just be the best ashwagandha. Yes, I have a bias. Um, tale of two curcumin. So I did wanna just mention, so curcumin and turmeric, another really great cardiovascular herb, uh, very much associated with um, all things vascular, because uh, it is, it's very, curcumin's an antioxidant. That said, we have two curcumin products. Sometimes people get confused about them. The way I like to tell people is think of curcumin 97, which is just pure curcumin in a capsule. Think of that as like a salve for the gut lining. So it goes and it just coats the gut and it heals the gut, right? It supports healthy gut function. Um, whereas co-curcumin, this has trica two in it and coq 10. Um, and so it's very, very well absorbed. And so that is more of your system. When you think of, I want curcumin to do this or that, and it's not GI related, go with the co-curcumin. So I just have to, you know, say that because I, I find that there's a little bit of confusion. And so if I were to say, want to do cardiovascular support and I thought curcumin was indicated, I would use co-curcumin. So let's talk about some more supplementary supplements. I thought it was very funny when I wrote that. Um, probiotics. So ooh, a, little a little tip for co-curcumin. Um, if you or your patient ever spill it on any surface, clean it with coconut milk. Dr. Sodi taught you that, awesome. I will literally and intentionally go spill it because I have some myself and I will explore. Don't, um, do, that. Uh, Don't do that, it's a pill still, it's several times to clean up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> all right, I'll, if I do, I'll do it on a piece of paper, or something. just explore. Um, okay, so uh, again, when we're thinking about cardiovascular health, Sure, we're focused on the heart. Sure, we're focused on the vessels. But you know, the cardiovascular system is also associated with all, you know, the knee bones connected to the heart bone. So you do want to make sure you're taking care of the gut, taking care of the liver, taking care of the kidneys, taking care of the lungs. We also know that there's human trial research that supports, once again, that the microbiome plays a really big role in basically all aspects of health and or disease. That said, what did I say about the large intestine earlier? You know, this is a pop quiz that we don't have time for, but um, vata is housed in the colon, they say. And vata is one of the primary doshas that we think is responsible for cardiovascular issues. So probiotics from an Ayurvedic standpoint would be indicated to treat any vata associated condition. Now we know that probiotics actually do in fact impact cardiovascular wellness. So once again, this will continue happening, but uh, Western research validates Ayurvedic uh, philosophy. It just takes a minute to put all the pieces together. Fish oil, I don't think I honestly need to say much more about fish oil. Um, I think everybody knows that it's useful. And that said, um, I do want to point that sustainability in fish oil is a really big issue, and we work very hard to ensure that we are doing it in the most sustainable way. Um, we are MSC certified fish oil. Um, we use Alaskan Pollock. Uh, we, it's very much uh, a delicate fish oil operation because we know the impacts of the fish oil industry have been in the oceans. 
Livet 2, so this is our liver support product. Um, like I said, if you're trying to treat any disease it's, or any condition, it's always good to support all the organs. Livet 2 is our really holistic liver support because in essence, um, it does not uh, just treat the liver, but you know, people like to associate. It treats the urinary, the biliary, respiratory, integumentary. It's just helping with all aspects of detox. So as I said in Ayurveda, we like to have a strategy where we remove the impure and restore the normal, right? Let's support the normal, remove the abnormal. Libit 2 is your remove the abnormal. Very, very useful, very safe, and it has a lot of other things. <laughs> um, Rentone. Rentone is our kidney support formula. And we do, of course, the kidneys are very much associated with um, cardiovascular wellness. And so um, we have formulated Rentone. I really, really like uh, Rentone. I actually will often, um, for certain patients, I will often do Carbtone and Rentone just from the start um, when I want to really be, do the most support I can to the cardiovascular system. I feel it needs to be really toned up, really fixed then I will put them together. Very, very useful. Super mag, magnesium, right? Magnesium, it's good for everything. Um, we have a really nice one because it's this uh, mixed bag of magnesium. So it's got multiple types. Um, so therefore we get that maximum absorption that we're looking for. Um, heart health, pulmonary function, blood sugar support. You know, it never ends with magnesium and uh, that this is ours. I, th I cannot believe it, but I did it. I got to the end. Does anyone have any questions you can put in the chat or say out loud? Please just unmute yourself if you're going to ask the question out loud. Otherwise, as you said, the chat works great. One thing while you guys are thinking about those questions that I wanted to let you know is that we are going to be offering free shipping to all of you guys that were able to attend. And so the code is going to be Ayush SHIP, all one word, all capitalized through evolvingnutrition.com. I wanted to get on the Ayush SHIP. Maybe we'll have a cruise one day. Right? <laughs> Although cruises are technically not environmentally. Not a great fun, idea right now either. But, but I will fantasize about a happy Ayush cruise, the okay. Ayush SHIP. Um, thank you so much, Tracy. Yeah, it's always so hard with these talks. I, I have so much I want to give you. I have so much I want to teach, and I have one exact hour to do it. So I'm I'm honestly surprised we got through all of that. Um, and again, if no one has any questions, perfectly okay. Um, thank you for coming and hanging out. Uh, once again, I'm Dr. Brian Keenan. I am a naturopathic doctor and I am an uh, acupuncturist, but I am the education manager here at IU Sherbs. If you have any additional questions about um, IUSH products uh, or, you know, uh, sometimes people who are, want to talk to me about cases, um, I obviously can't diagnose and treat for you. But if you have questions about IUSH products and uh, how it relates to your practice, you can always email me. I just threw my email in the chat and you can call our helpline as well. We're also always here to help. I've, we've got a nutritionist on staff and I'm very knowledgeable. So any tech questions you might have, please feel free to reach out to me as well. And I will pop my email in the chat. Excellent. Um, and I don't know if they can see the chat on the recording. So my email is brian, B-R-I-A-N at iush.com. That is a good point. <laughs> <laughs> Mine is Amanda, A-M-A-N-D-A -A at evolvingnutrition.com. <laughs> Yes, Nina, I, I sure hope to, to meet sometime. I will be at the AMP Symposium in Washington this year. So that'll be my kind of debut with the Ayush uh, team because it's been the pandemic the whole time I've been employed. So there haven't been any conferences yet. All right, I hope everyone has a wonderful day. I'm gonna, I'm gonna sign off. And uh, again, any questions, by all means, you've got Amanda's information, you've got mine, we can help you. Thank you so much, everyone, for attending. We really appreciate it. Have a Bye -bye. great day. Looking forward to working with you.